All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to Tuesday and IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and today's discussion is on lighting and the NEC. We've got, we're going to be talking about some of the brand new solutions that are out today. No, we're not. We're going to be talking about the National Electrical Code and lighting. And you know what? It all starts now. All right. Well, that was fast. Phil, hi to you. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you again online. It was great seeing you out at the Electrical Safety Workshop, buddy. So I really appreciated uh, our time together. Good afternoon. Paul Flager, good to see you. Or see your name, actually. <laughs> All right. So today's discussion is on lighting and the NEC. And I'm telling you what, uh, there's... Um, there's a lot to be uh, to be said about this topic, so I am going to actually try to get into this right now because we are going to use the entire hour and uh, maybe then some, but I'm not going. I'm going to try not to go over. But we do have a lot of material and um, a lot of um, content to to get through. So Lou Petrucci, Lou, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. And I'm looking for, I need, I need my thinking pen and I don't have my Keith Laughlin thinking pen. I can't think without my pen. I don't know how many of you have to have something in your hand, but I need to have like a pen in my hand. I don't know what it is. And got to have thinking, a thinking paper too. So I got my thinking paper just in case. All right. Let's talk lighting. So did you know that lighting represents 22%, probably more, of the consumed energy in the United States. If you think about, just go into any structure, any building, light is an important part of our lives, especially when it gets dark out. So when, when that big light bulb in the sky goes behind the clouds or goes to sleep at night. Um, or just goes around the other side of the earth. I don't know. I don't know where it goes every night, but I think that um, I think it probably just goes to sleep. You know, that's probably that sun can burn out too. Ah, see, Steve, you are the man. So we are going to be talking about everything. We're going to hit as much of this topic on luminaires, lighting, um, protection as we can in this hour. So another important thing. So when we think about light and we think about the energy usage, right? So if I, if I did a pie chart of the energy usage within a structure, lighting would be up there uh, with uh, how much energy that we spend to illuminate our areas within our structures. So for obvious reasons, this has been a target for cost reduction, efficiencies. How can we reduce the cost? Hey, Felix Sandoval, good, 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 uh, good morning from the um, from Colombia. So, so we focus on areas within the power distribution system to save money, to save, to reduce the costs for a structure lighting is an important, plays an important part of that. So we do a couple different things. We address lighting from a technology perspective. If you think about this light bulb, which I'm not sure the vintage of this, there's no date on it, but it wasn't made yesterday. I can guarantee that. Um, when I look at this technology and how it has progressed over time, you can see the amount of effort that has been expended on taking this technology to a different level, addressing the energy usage, addressing the ener the the luminaire output, the the um, the ability of of uh, this device to light an area, illuminate an area of the room. So efficiencies 
are taken into consideration in this technology on both ends, the amount of energy that it that it consumes and the amount of light that it places in an area. So we see, a, we have seen, and probably have yet to see the, uh, the, the conclusion of the development of the technology around lighting. 50% of the energy saved reduces greenhouse emissions 50%. So the other aspect of lighting is not just on the amount of energy that the, the you know, the bill that we pay, it's, we directly associate the energy used and consumed by lighting with greenhouse emissions. So it has a sustainability message as well. And which is another reason we see changes in this industry. Now, this slide here, I'm going to give you a little close up. The, the, there's various types of uh, methods to provide light. We have thermal radiation, which, which is very familiar, which we've seen in our, um, uh, our incandescent bulbs, right? We've seen uh, these types of uh, incandescent lamps where we're, we basically, uh, the, it's a thermal light source. You have halogen incandescent lamps. You have gas discharge. So we moved to technology to gas dis discharge. And then you moved into light emitting diodes. So from a historical perspective, we've gone from that, that um, um, lighting, and, uh, lighting a, a filament inside or causing something to glow to leveraging something like these light emitting diodes, which is uh, uh, another part of nature that provides more light at lower voltages, et cetera, less energy usage, or so we think. All right, so current in a, in a uh, incandescent lamp, current flows through a filament, it heats it up, and uh, it's exactly the same way as an incandescent lamp, and, and then it releases heat, it releases energy in the form of light. Now, halogen boosts the efficiency and prolongs the service life of those lamps. So whenever you see a, hey, Mr. Hofkin, good day to you. Good to see you online. Thanks for joining us. Halogen cycle boosts the efficiencies and prolongs the service life. So those are two aspects from a, light, from a, um, a lighting perspective. We want, to, we want to be efficient. Efficient not only in the amount of energy that we're using, but efficient in how much light that we are providing to a surface, an area. But we also want to make sure that we extend the life of these products. And why, why would I be concerned about that? Well, typically, these, the, typically to get access to change uh, the, the, um, the, the, Changing out, change out like say a bulb or whatnot, I'm going to be getting on ladders, I'm going to be getting um, in areas that could be dangerous, so to speak, right? So the longer, or the less frequent that I need to get on ladder scaffolding, et cetera, to, to, um, to replace solutions, lighting solutions, the, the, the better off I am. So, and, and, and less expensive it is, right? So you'll see, uh, efforts to increase the life of these products and installations. Your halogen incandescent lights, you probably see this. In fact, I've got one, I've got a curio cabinet here that leverages a light, just a, a lamp, just like this. Um, so, and you'll see the different technologies and we'll talk about these connection points. And, and we know that there are various methods uh, to, to uh, connect a lamp into a fixture, right? Or we don't call it a, a fixture anymore. We call that the luminaire. So, but in any case, we'll get into those terminology differences as well. Now, then we moved into fluorescence, right? So fluorescence is just a different way to generate the, the light that we, uh, that we project on in a surface or in an area. So your fluorescent, it leverages uh, an amalgam technology, basically, where we are, it's the same fundamental principle. You, you need to create a, um, you need to create a light either through heating an element or in these cases by, um, by leveraging a ballast and create a radiation or, 
or generate a radiation that converts that radiation into high quality visible light. So there's a process of that. And then they use the, the amalgam um, technology and, and amalgam is, is, it sounds like a detailed technical term, but uh, basically mixing metal with mercury to soften it. Um, so now that's the other thing with, with these fluorescent types of lights or lamps, you, you are, how would you say, um, these lamps employ mercury, which mercury is not something that we want to consume through the mouth, through the eyes, through the hands. So we have to treat these bulbs or these um, lamps as, and you know, you know what, the, the terminology in this world is crazy, but uh, so we're, we're changing, uh, changing that terminology. So I'm going to definitely uh, screw up some terms here and I'm gonna have you keep me honest in the chat. The lamp itself um, is, is something that employs uh, a mercury substance with uh, which is developed through a mixture of metals with mercury uh, to help it create that lighting. And you you know you've seen the tubes. And again, there's those connection points, right? So uh, these different ways to to connect a lamp into a fixture or a luminaire is um, is governed by standards. Whether it's these types of pins or those types of screw terminals like these standard Edison bases, right? So this Edison base has been around for many years and we still leverage this today. It's a standard. So if I make a lamp, I'm going to need to figure out how I'm going to interface the lamp with the circuit to the, well, we've called these things fixtures in the past, but the luminaire, the luminaire, I'm going to interface these via this connection via a standard and these the connection points are all governed by standards now compact fluorescents now we've seen we saw these these were very very popular uh and they were always advertised as sustainable right because of um of um their watts and now and and, and I, I know i'm going to get into this discussion and I don't want to, but we have to understand that when we talk about lighting, when we talk about luminaires, when we talk about lamps, we always think about the watt usage being less. But in reality, it's VA. We as engineers in the electrical industry, we don't worry about, I mean, we worry about watts, but we really worry about sizing equipment based upon VA. So the power factor of all of these technologies is very important to us as designers and installers, as individuals who want to meet the requirements of the National Electrical Code for sizing brand circuits. So we can't think of life in the world of watts when we talk about lighting anymore. These uh, solutions employ, um, where is it here? Uh, lumin, lumin, luminous flux of these lamps, the highly dependent operating position, ambient temperature. Let's go back. Um, the tubes, white fluorescence. Okay, these lamps need igniters and current limiting. The functions are combined are, are combined in an, an electronic electronic ballasts. So many of these lamps, when you get into fluorescent and compact fluorescence, uh, all of these types of lamps. They employ ballasts, and, and a ballast is not a resistive component. It is represented by a resistance and an inductance, so it is not unity power factor. Many of these compact fluorescents and whatnot are, say, 0.5 power factor, which means my watts... To get my VA, I take my watts times two, if it's 0.5, to find out what my VA is. So if I have a 10-watt lamp or a 50-watt lamp that is a compact fluorescent or a fluorescent lamp, and it's at a 0.5 power factor, so say it's um, it's 50 watts, uh, say, say, it's, a, say it's, it's one amp of load, I'd have to multiply that by two to get what my actual uh, VA is, so watts to VA, 
right? So to get my VA, if it's a 50 watt lamp to get the VA for a 0.5 power factor, I multiply that by two, that would be a um, 100, watt, 100 VA. And that's what I would use to size my circuit, not 50 watts. Hopefully you, you understand that and, and you really got to understand the power triangle to comprehend what I'm talking about there. Felix Sandoval, are fluorescent and discharge lamps disappearing from the market due to mercury and other harmful substances? I'll tell you, Felix, I, in my opinion, and I know you can still buy them, uh, you can still buy these too, right? I mean, this is an oldie, but a goodie, but you can still buy your standard, um, your standard uh, types of, uh, of um, lamp that we've seen over the years. But I do think that the that the the fluorescent technologies are going by the wayside for what they're making way for your so these types of products are making their way for for LEDs which is one of my slides that's what I wanted to go to but um, but your LED technology is becoming your more sustainable um, environment uh, in healthier type of solution. So Felix, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not a manufacturer of uh, fluorescence, but um, I've heard that concern about the hazardous component of the, those solutions. And, um, and, and we've got these LED technologies waiting in the wings there and, and they're being used heavily throughout our electrical industry. Uh, so I think in my opinion, and I know everybody has their own opinion, and anything said on this program is my opinion and my opinion only, not of IAEI, NFPA, Eaton, or um, any of the code-making panels. In my opinion, I think LED lighting is uh, taking a lead in the sustainability world. Then you can move into metal halide. Metal halide lamps, they, they're extremely compact electric arc in a discharge tube. Uh, it's um, there's a lot, a lot of different components and materials inside of that uh, inside inside of the uh, the lamp itself. Uh, they do also need an igniter to start it, so you're going to have a ballast there as well. Uh, the metal halides aren't going to have a unity power factor. Neither does LED. LED lighting does not have a unity power factor. Your incandescent bulbs. I mean, you can't beat a resistive element from a power factor perspective. Uh, there are probably more efficient ways to deliver light than than what we used to do back in the day, but um, you got to remember it's not about watts; it's about VA. Um, these are what these bulbs, uh, these lamps look like, right? So they've got you'll see some some uh, circuitry in there a little bit, diodes and whatnot, and. Um, comprising that that uh, that lamp then you have a high pressure sodium discharge okay these are your elongated ceramic discharge tubes you got uh, you've got some color improvements from a light that's the other thing when you get into into light itself and you know and i never appreciate i never got an appreciate appreciation of this until i was in a few facilities where they were comparing an led light to uh, compact fluorescent to your standard incandescent and what it means with regard to color and and how the um, the light may change the say the color of paint or um, your fabrics and you know there's there's white light there's there's different types of light that you can emit um, and this happened to me on my on my house here I I changed my outside lights from a fluorescent to a um, an LED. So the front of my house is lit up with LEDs. And when I purchased them, I wasn't as aware of the different types of white light, yellow light, etc. And when we turned it on, I had a white house. My house was painted white at the time. It's that hardy board siding. And wow, hey, Raphael, good to see you. Wow, was it very white. Um, I didn't change those lights out. I still have them. But then I learned subsequently that there are different representations, that different types of LED lighting that you can purchase that will put out different colors of light. These are your high pressure soda, sodium discharge lights. You'll see, I think you see a lot of these outdoors on the outside. They've got your main electrodes. Um, they've got supports in there. 
so there's a, uh, a starting resistance because again, you need to start that process to get it moving. So, uh, and to get that light going. Then you got your LEDs. And this is, I'd say this is your latest technology that's out there on the market. And uh, they're modern semiconductor devices. And they're, they're the, uh, the, the characteristics are determined by obviously the materials and the design. And there's different ways to construct an, uh, a, a lamp, so to speak, of, uh, for the LEDs. You can put multiple LEDs I've, and you can do strings of LEDs. So there's an active semiconductor layer that uh, radiation is produced. So you'll see multiple different types of configurations and, and, and you can change the colors of these as well. So, and you'll see these on light strings where you can change the color, like for amb ambiance lighting and whatnot, where you, whether you're putting it under a uh, kitchen cabinet. Um, um, so there's different ways that you can, um, that you can, uh, represent light from a color perspective. There's no filament, no gas. It's very robust, um, high efficiency and um, and low maintenance, right? So you can get a long life out of these. So so there's an attractive appeal for when you have an, a, a luminaire that's, that's maybe in a high ceiling that you might have to get a scissor lift to go change, uh, putting LED lighting in those applications where I don't have to go in that scissor list, go up and change a uh, um, the lamp uh, in a fixture as often, right? So there's there's and, and I could argue there's even a safety aspect of that as well. Uh, the drawbacks uh, they they can be expensive, but I've I've seen the cost of these come down over time, and just because of the proliferation of the technology, uh, they are temperature sensitive. So whenever you see a a luminaire that that accepts uh, LED lamping, the, um, the, the luminaire may have a large heat sink associated with it to draw that heat off. Uh, you're converting AC to DC in that process of, um, of providing power to the lamp. Efficacy is that power to produce a desired result or, of, or effect, and that's just a definition term. All right, so... Uh, low power for five millimeter LEDs, high power reflow solder LEDs, uh, chip on board. Um, there's so many different ways that we are using LEDs these days that um, uh, the packaging is is phenomenal. I have a I have a string of LEDs uh, laying on the floor behind me uh, to light up a portion a portion of my um, of my green screen that's behind me. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I use those uh, a similar product on um, underneath cabinets, right? So they can be small. They can be placed in very small areas. They present uh, some really good light for an area, and they're very controllable. And they're they're they can be controlled uh, from a color perspective as well. You have a single LED on a chip. You can have epoxy um, LED lenses on your LEDs. Uh, you can have an array of LEDs. Uh, there's an example of the various examples of how you can uh, assemble the LEDs, whether you, uh, uh, depending on how much light you actually need. We put, we're putting these now on, uh, on, on lights for like work lights and whatnot. You know, it provides a lot of light, very light. Uh, substance and then since it's DC powered and you have a DC battery uh, very easily powered from a battery source no need to convert so to speak very small in their technology and very efficient at providing lights right so when you look at all the different technologies to answer Felix's question um, do I you know do I see these those uh, those other fluorescent type of solutions disappearing I I I don't know if it's disappear. I don't think, I think that the sales of those products are probably uh, being displaced by LED technology for more than just the fact that, uh, that there are, um, there's mercury and whatnot and, and hazardous type of materials in the, uh, in those other, in, in, in those types of technologies. I think it's more around efficiency, size and whatnot. Now the energy savings are from an LED incandescent and halogen, 50 to 78 percent better than incandescent, rapidly increasing efficiencies, long life, 20 times the incandescent. Um, thermal management for LEDs operate much uh, cooler than incandescent lamps, so that's true. But when you look at that, look at that, um, 
that heat sink that we have around the LEDs. You know, 99% of heat generator is con generated is conduction. So the bulb or the, the lamp, the light source might be cool, but the driver that does the conversion from AC to DC and powers that uh, can generate um, heat. Um, we'll go by that. All right, so let's just talk about some definitions. Electrical discharge lighting, we talked about that. Systems of illumination utilizing fluorescent lamps, high intensity discharge lamps or neon tubing. That's code panel 18. Festoon lighting. So these are your outdoor lights that are suspended between two points. So those are your festoon lighting. And that's uh, again, covered by uh, code making panel 18. You have your lighting outlet, right? So an outlet that is intended for the direct connection of a lamp holder or luminaire is a lighting outlet. We know what a receptacle outlet is. That's when I would have a receptacle in. So if I have an outlet and I put a lighting um, luminaire in, remember we're getting away from saying fixture to luminaire. So that is very difficult for some people, including this guy, okay? I always wanna say a lighting fixture, but but that's, that's ungood anymore. We wanna say lighting luminaires or luminaires, lamp holders. Remember, this, this here is your lamp. This is your holder or your luminaire. And we're going to get to the definition of a luminaire. Track lighting, manufacture assembly designed to support and energize luminaires that are capable of being readily repositioned on the track. So, and, and you, can, you can change, you can add length, you can subtract length, etc. Now, here's the defin of definition of a luminaire. A luminaire is a complete lighting unit consisting of a light source, such as a lamp, or lamps together with the parts designed to position the light source and connect it to the power supply. It may also include parts to protect the light source or ballast or to distribute the light. A lamp holder itself is not a luminaire, right? So the luminaire includes the lamps. I'm gonna just take a look at the 2020 code and see what it says, luminaire. A complete lighting unit consisting of a light source, so that hasn't changed at all, probably hasn't changed in a very long time. We don't define lamp. We don't define lamp holder that I can find. Not that I can, not that I can find. Now remember, so this is, um, this is another aspect from a code perspective. You know, it, it's nice to be able to go to one spot to find all the definitions, but you can never say we don't define a term unless you go to all of the different articles to find out if that term is defined anywhere in those other sections. Now, 410, Article 410 is the article for luminaires, lamp holders, and lamps. So if I go to 410, they have a closed closet storage space defined in 410, and that's the only definition that they have. So lamp holder is not, dis not defined. Neither is a lamp. I don't believe a lamp is defined either. No. Labeled laundry lighting outlet. So the, the term lamp is not defined. Another interesting, incandescent lamps. So where do we go if it's not defined? We go to Webster, right? So Webster definition of lamp. Let's see what Webster calls it. Webster, Webster says lamp. Definition of lamp, any of various devices for producing light or sometimes heat, such as a vessel with a wick for burning an inflammable liquid, such as oil to produce light, a glass bulb or tube that emits light produced by electricity. So that's the term that we would go back to. Remember, if it's not defined in the National Electrical Code, we go back to Merriam-Webster.
dictionary. Utilization equipment, equipment that utilizes electric energy for electronic, electromechanical, chemical heating, lighting, or similar purposes. That's another important term for us to remember when it comes to lighting and luminaires. These are all your lamp holders. So we know what a lamp is. So a lamp holder would, hold, would, would obviously hold the lamp. Now, here's the, um, here's the different methods to interface a lamp with into a lamp holder, which would then be used to insert it into the circuit, right? So you have all of these different screw bases, specialty bases, pin bases, fluorescent pin bases, compact fluorescent plug-in lamp bases. There are so many different methods to use. They've got, I mean, you've got to standardize because otherwise, how can you determine the methods? And then if I am presented with, with this, what is it? Is it an E17? Is it an E14? Is it an E12? Is it an E27? An E89? A 39? An E40? Right? So you've got your medium, you've got your mogul, extended mogul, you've got your medium standard, European. There's so many different types of, I don't know if, about you, but I, you know, when you're looking, if you didn't have the original lamp, to take to the store with you to figure out what you need to get, it can be challenging. I can, I can see that right off the bat, absolutely. So there's your, there's your um, bayonet caps, your Edison screw, also known as ES or E27. So your Edison screw is an E27 and based, and that was, the E27 was right in, um, in this world over here. That's your medium uh, base or your, yeah, screw bases. Your low voltage, <clears throat> small bayonet caps, small Edison screw, giant Edison screw. There's so many, so many different that, um, it, 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 you've, you really have to understand what is being used in the application to be able to pick the right lamp. And then if you have the lamp that you know you want to use, that you based your design on, you need to find the luminaire that has the right base in it, lamp base, to be able to connect it. There's your base sizes. Get me out of here. You have your single contact bases. There's again, that's just a another blow up of uh, of the previous um, the previous the previous discussion points. So, what's the difference between a luminaire and a light fixture? So, those are terms. That's a term, light fixture. We use. I mean, I know you. There's probably every a lot of people out there that use that term, light fixture. We don't use that anymore. We use the term luminaire. So we got to go back to the definition, a complete lighting unit consisting of a light source. So the lamp together with parts designed to position the light source and connect it to the power supply. So your lamp, your lamp base, and everything else associated with holding it all together, that is your luminaire. So a lamp holder itself is not a luminaire. The term luminaire was added in the 2002 edition of the NEC. Lighting fixture is not defined in any standard. I would say it's almost as if you would call it slang, right? It's just a term that we use uh, that uh, we, we call something. That's just a term that we use. So why do we adopt luminaire? Well, the the... The standardization, the luminaire is used not only by the IES Lighting Handbook and NEMA standards, but also by the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC. So there are many different other standards that use the term luminaire. Yet, I don't know why, but our industry 
out in the field loves to call it a lighting fixture. That's not the right term anymore. So in the 2002 edition of the NEC, we added that term luminaire. So, and this was the original definition, a complete lighting unit consisting of a lamp or lamps together with the parts designated, designed to distribute the light to position and protect the lamps and ballast and to connect the lamps to the power supply. So that was the, the first introduction of the term luminaire, uh, which was a part of the 2002 version. They modified it in 2008 to read as follows, as follows, a complete lighting unit consisting of a light source, such as a lamp or lamps, together with the parts designed to position the light source and connect to the power supply. It may also include parts to protect the light source or the ballast or to distribute the light and then a lamp holder. So I believe that's basically what we see today. There are a lot of different types of luminaires. You've got the traditional type and you've got the non-traditional type, fiber optics, with the light source at one location, uh, the, the, the quote unquote light pipes, right? That is a luminaire. So it's not a light fixture, it's a luminaire. That's a luminaire, it's not a light fixture, it's a luminaire. That is a luminaire, it's not a what? Light fixture, it's a luminaire. And it's not an aluminum air, it's a luminaire. It sounds like you're saying aluminum air, doesn't it? It's not aluminum air. It's luminaire. It's, it just seems like that term should have like an A at the beginning of it. It shouldn't be luminaire. It should be aluminaire. <laughs> I don't know. Illuminaire. But it's just luminaire. That is a, that is a luminaire, not a light fixture. Now, then we get into the discussion of that probably created in the field, probably created by, um, I don't know, a um, energetic, enthusiastic electrician who um, said, I got, an, I got an idea. I'm going to bend some conduit and we're going to make a luminaire. But in 4.10, we say in 4.10.6, all luminaires, lamp holders, and retrofit kits shall be listed. So that has to be a listed creative genius. That, I mean, it's a luminaire. It is, it meets the definitions of a luminaire. But the question would be, based on 410.6, is it listed? Now, if that if you got creative, you've got a great artist, you've got Picasso himself, come back and make that for you. Worth $20 million, because A, Picasso ain't around anymore and you managed to resurrect him, and B, it's a Picasso. You're going to get a field evaluation, right? Because it has to be listed. And if it's not listed, you have a couple choices. You don't install it, or the AHJ says, I want to get a field evaluation, and you get someone to come out and look at it and determine what they need to do to be, make it uh, compliant. And they would look at the standards and do a field evaluation by a field evaluation body. I took that photo. I took that photo. It was at an NFPA meeting. And... There was something about this fixture, about this luminaire, <laughs> that I can't remember what it was. But it was, it is a luminaire. I definitely wasn't in a shower or anything like that. It was in the ceiling, I believe, above a wet bar. Anyway, can't remember. Which now brings us into the discussion of markings. Now, luminaire markings. And I know, I'm going to see if I can find it here. Luminaire, A-I-R-E, UL Marking Guide. I don't know if there is a UL Marking Guide. Yes, there is. This is a great resource for you, and I'm going to put it in the chat. Control-C, Control-V. So I just shared with you, and I know it went to Facebook, and I know it went to um, YouTube. So if you're watching on LinkedIn, you got to get out to the YouTube site to see that chat stream. 
and find that. So, and you should be a follower and a member of the IAEI's YouTube channel. So please go out and subscribe to the YouTube channel for IAEI. And um, I believe it, uh, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong because if you subscribe and you hit the bell, you'll be notified every time we post a new video or we go live. So Michael, thank you. UL 1598 is the safety standard for luminaires. So 1598 is your safety standard. Take a look at this marking guide. And you know, Michael, um, I know that you guys and gals out there at UL have moved some things around and, and, and the marking guide might be a part of, I can't remember the terminology. If you can put a link down to uh, UL's resource with regard to um, what used to be called the white book. I still can't get off the white book. Just like I keep calling things fixtures, I still call those uh, reference materials with the white book. So, but this marking guide that I just posted in there, I believe is a really great resource for you because it helps you understand all of the markings on a, uh, a luminaire. And, and you'll have the wet location, the dry location, so this will just give you a, a little for in, instance, you know, dry locations, a luminaire intended for use in a location not normally subject to dampness, but may include a location subject to temporary dampness, as in the case of a building under construction, provided ventilation is adequate to provide an acu prevent an accumulation of moisture is marked dry locations only. Then you have damp locations. Only luminaires marked suitable for damp locations or suitable for wet locations are intended to be installed in damp locations. So, and then you have the wet locations. You have covered ceiling mount only, less than four feet above ground level, below ground level. Look, just think about all the different markings that are available on these luminaires. Okay, so if it's a wet location, it could be a wet location luminaire co marked covered ceiling mount only, which, so, so this is what you'll find in the vehicle washing areas where luminaires aren't subject to water and precipitation from the back side, only the front side, a ceiling mount luminaire not identified for covering. Then you have, you have the four foot above ground level, and it'll say suitable for mounting within 1.24 meters, four feet of ground. Luminaires with this marking are intended to be subjected to water from lawn and garden sprinkler systems, but not intended to be installed at or below ground level where they may be subjected to immersion in water. And then you got below ground level. That's suitable for ground mounted recessed. So there are, there are so many different types of markings on these products that it's important to become familiar with them. And when you're looking at the installation and where these luminaires are installed, you've got to make sure they're listed and rated for the application. The best way to do that is to look at the markings and understand the markings. You've got dry locations. You have damp locations. You have wet locations. You have wet locations, ceiling, uh, covered ceiling mounts less than four foot, below ground. You have restricted location markings, outdoor use only. A fluorescent luminaire that is intended for in outdoor use only is marked outdoor use only and is not required to have a class P protected ballast. Now, if it says outdoor use only, you can't use it indoors. There might be reasons why you can't use it indoors. It might be heat related combustible related? I don't know. But if it says outdoor use only, that word only is a critical piece of that label, right? Uh, not for use in dwellings. An electric discharge luminaire that has a ballast with an output open circuit voltage greater than a thousand volts is marked not for use in dwellings. A luminaire marked for supply wire rated over 90 degrees C is also marked not for use in dwellings. That doesn't mean you can use it in a dwelling. It means you can't. Wall mount only. Luminaire that may be mounted only to a wall because of the temperature or other considerations. Wall mount only. Don't put it in the ceiling. Don't put it in the floor. Then you have a ceiling mount only. Track lighting. Good example of that. For use with ceiling mount track only. Non-combustible surfaces only. 
a ceiling uh, mounted or ground mounted recessed luminaire that is permitted to be mounted only to a non combustible ceiling. And it has to deal with the temperatures. Then you have non fire rated recessed ceilings only. So there are many, like my, my basement ceiling here is not fire rated, so I can, I can use um, non fire rated recessed ceilings. But if I had, say, a separation between two, two dwellings, and my ceiling was a separation between dwellings, that's gonna be a fire barrier. I can't use a non-fire rated recessed ceiling um, luminaire. Fire resistant construction only, recessed luminaire that produces a temperature rise greater than 65, that's 117 degrees Fahrenheit on a mounted mounting surface or, of, or, or recessed housing is marked install in buildings of fire resistant construction, mount on non-combustible material. Then you have concrete only. Did you think that a luminaire could be this complicated? When you installed the last luminaire you looked at, did you think about all of these different ratings? Did you think about the surface materials that you were using? Now, here's what we do. Typically, we get, we, we, we'll get a set of construction. And we'll go, well, you know, I do residential uh, dwelling units. I know what can lights I buy. I buy these can lights. I put them in. I buy these uh, these types of uh, fixtures. I put them in. So you have your standard technical, um, you have your standard bill of material, so to speak. And quite frankly, that bill of material probably was developed by somebody else well before you came along. And you just accept that's what I use in these applications. I'll bet nine times out of 10, that's basically what you're dealing. You probably never really considered looking at the ratings. Hey, Nihad, El Sharif, great to see you, buddy. You probably never really looked at these ratings, uh, especially in a dwelling unit. But I'm telling you, you ought to take a look at the fixtures you're using, at the luminaires that you are using. <laughs> see, I'm telling you, fixtures just, it flows. It's just so much easier to say, right? Product IQ uh, is complimentary. Registration is required. So product IQ is a free uh, a tool that you can use. So access that and you can find all this and much more information. Um, permissive location marking, suitable for use in poured concrete. So suitable for use in, doesn't have to be used, but it's suitable for use in poured concrete, suitable for use in suspended ceilings, suitable for use under cabinet mounting. So uh, various luminaires will, um, we call this a permissive, meaning it doesn't have to be installed in poured concrete. You can install that in, uh, not in poured concrete. So it's suitable for use in poured concrete. So that's another important, this is a little different than the previous. Remember we said uh, uh, these are restricted locations, fire resistant construction only, non-combustible surfaces only, ceilings only, wall mounted only. When you get into permissive, now you can install it in concrete, but you don't have to. So it's a little bit more flexibility. Then there's special elevated ambience, commercial cooking hoods, germicidal lamp use, air handling use. So there are various special use markings that you need to consider based upon the application. So if you are doing commercial kitchens, you might wanna understand what we mean by commercial cooking hood use and why one luminaire is good for that and another is not. Germicidal lamp use, germicidal lamps. Germicidal, G-E-R-M-I-C-I-D-A-L, lamp use. Where would you use that? Oh, disinfection for air, water, non-pure uh, services. Uh, okay, so UVC lamps are often called germicidal lamps. So UVC radiation is known as disinfectant for air, water, and non-pore surfaces. UVC radiation has effectively been used to de for decades to reduce the spread of bacteria such as tuberculosis. And they call those germicidal lamps. See, you learn something every day. I don't think it'll help with COVID though, I don't know. Don't stand under a germicidal lamp thinking you're gonna get rid of COVID. All right, so here's another, this is a good picture of, of your luminaires that are high up in the ceiling. Now, to change the lamps in these luminaires, you would need to obviously get on a lift. 
You're not going to do this on a, I mean, they could probably, they, they, you know, they probably make step ladders that big, but you would typically get in a lift to get up and change these lamps. So the uh, use of LED lighting in these applications reduces the amount of times you'll have to get up in that lift to change those lights. And we talked about that as a value proposition a little bit ago. There's another example of uh, a luminaire that might be a damp location, not necessarily a wet location, but it, again, it has to be listed for that application. These are your, this is a, um, I took this photo in, an, in, a, in a, um, a manufacturing facility that uh, put some special liquid in bottles, just saying, in St. Louis. So, these lights, uh, these lighting luminaires uh, are of, of obvious. I mean, just based upon what you're seeing there, you can see that they're protected in a special way and they are uh, providing a lot of light for that entire area. And they're in an environment that, um, that may require some special uh, types of luminaire listings. There's another example of a luminaire that will we'll tell you, let me try to get my, you know, when you look at this, uh, the lamping of this, you'll know, you have to ask a question, is this luminaire listed for use with a compact fluorescent type of luminaire? It may or may not be. And on the labels, it will tell you what luminaire or what lamps are permitted inside of these luminaires. So not all luminaires can accept every type of lamp, even if it has the right base uh, lamp holder that it fits in. So you've got to be careful on what lamp you are using in the luminaire. Hopefully that makes sense. Here's an example of, you know, this tells you replace with 13 watt lamp only. They're very specific. And, uh, you know, there's an example of your, um, uh, remember, it's, it's listed for this application, uh, but I took this photo because look at that glass is, uh, is obviously been uh, compromised, right? So maintenance, 70B, looking through your facility, identifying applications like this where you have an issue, very important piece of the puzzle. So 220.14D indicates an outlet supplying luminaires shall be calculated based on the maximum volt ampere rating of the equipment and lamps for which the luminaire is rated. Provide examples of typical incandescent, fluorescent, HID, and LED luminaires. Do all luminaire manufacturers provide markings the same way to determine the rating? Are the markings from an individual manufacturer the same for all products within each of the previous types of luminaires? Tell me that's not a good question, huh? That's a good question. All right, so here's a picture. 660 watts, 250 volts. Now, um, that looks like a porcelain base, okay? And probably accepts an incandescent bulb, which would be rated in watts because it's a purely resistive. Now, if I had an LED lamp that I put in that same holder, it might be a little different. If I had an compact fluorescent, this tells you what that lamp holder or luminaire can handle. It's not in VA. It doesn't speak to power factor at all. And I, I would almost argue that many of these luminaires go back in time where we only had incandescent bulbs that only dealt with watts and didn't deal with VA. Here's one. So this one here, input 125 volt AC, 60 hertz, 15 amps, output 5 volt DC, 2.1 amps. Conforms to UL 498 and 1310. Certified to CSA standard C22.2. It's a class two power unit. 
So it's giving you some information, not the same as the other. So my answer to this one, I think, would be that you have, um, it's not as consistent as we probably like it. And, and that goes for a lot of different types of luminaires. So it, it's really important to understand and look at each luminaire, look at how they're rated before purchasing, or if they're installed, you should have access to be able to see that information depending upon the light fixture, the luminaire, and how it's mounted. So how about this question? Are the requirements in NEC 220.14D and those in 220.18B the same or different? So 220.14, let's take a look at that. 220.14D. 220.14D. 220.14. Luminaires and outlets supplying luminaires shall be calculated based on the maximum volt ampere rating of the equipment and lamps for which the luminaire is rated. Pretty straightforward. Now, what's 220.18B? 220.18. 220.18 is maximum loads. B says inductive and LED lighting loads. For circuits supplying lighting units that have ballast, transformers, auto transformers, or LED drivers, the calculated load shall be based on the total ampere ratings of such units and not on the total watts of the lamps. So remember, this 220.18b recognizes the fact that many of these solutions have the power factor associated with them, not just watts. So let's see how I answered this one. Both of these are in part two of Article 220, which is branch circuit load calculations. So that's a good thing. 220.14 addresses the load calculations for other loads in all occupancies. D is luminaires. Both of these, uh, and section 220.18, addresses how much load can be placed on the branch circuit. So in all occupancies, the, uh, the minimum load for each outlet general, blah, blah, blah. The load shown being based on nominal branch circuit voltages, the, lo the leads of outlets serving switchboards, blah, blah, blah. So 220.14 focuses on the load calculation for all of the loads not already addressed in 220.12. Remember, 220 to 12, that's your VA per square foot. In all occupancies, the minimum lo load for each outlet. Okay, D, luminaires, we already read that. Total load shall not exceed the rating of the branch circuit and shall not exceed the maximum loads. And then we already talked about that. So that, that's basically telling you. So here's how I would, here's how I would answer that one. The 220.12D basically is telling you that the outlet supplying luminaires shall be based on the maximum VA. 220.18 or 16, or no, 18B just basically telling you, look, some of these, L, some of these uh, lamps, uh, some of these solutions are not incandescent. They're not resistive. They have power factors. So you can't use watts. You have to use the... Um, the VA. So <clears throat> that's the basic difference between the two. One says you got to use the maximum. The other one says, hey, if you're using these types of solutions, you just can't use the watts to determine that maximum. So they don't conflict with each other. They complement each other and recognize the technologies are different. All right. So we came up on an hour. I told you there are so many, and I might continue this discussion next week. Luminaires, man, so I'll give you some examples of the questions we're still going to look at. Are, uh, are luminaires manufactured for track lighting inherently protected from violations of NEC 220.43B? That's, the, that's that question. How about, how about this question? Energy codes are driving more, whoop. Let's take a look at this one. In other than dwelling units, NEC 210.23C permit 40 and 50 ampere branch circuits to supply fixed luminaires with heavy duty lamp holders. Are heavy duty lamp holders limited to incandescent luminaires? Question mark. Are fluorescent HID and or LED luminaires available with heavy duty lamp holders? That's another good question. 
That's and let's take a look at what number this. Since 210.23D prohibits branch circuits larger than 50 amps from supplying lighting outlets, does that requirement infer that all luminaires will be adequately protected by 50 amp or smaller overcurrent protection? Ooh. Question six. Since 210.23 prohibit branch circuit, does that requirement further? Oh, wait, that's oh, yeah, how about in, uh, so 24083 includes requirements for circuit breakers used to switch fluorescent and HID lighting circuits. Do those requirements apply to other equipment used to switch that lighting? Contactors, snap switches, dimmers, time clocks. There is a lot of details. There are a lot of details important for the proper installation and application of lighting solutions. So we will continue our discussion next week on the luminaire. We'll have to do a part two because I've got some other really good questions that I wanna go through and answer. Maybe I will take these questions and put those into a Word document and share those with you so you can do your homework this week and come up with what you think the answers are. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I will post. Uh, I will post this on. Um, I will create a link today for next week's session at twelve o'clock, where we will continue this, and I will post some of these questions so that you can take a look at them this week and come prepared with questions of your own, and maybe we'll do an interactive session where you tell me the answer, and we'll see how many of you get it right. So we'll do that. All right, so that's about an hour and, and how fast how fast and fun and furious that is. Uh, I can't believe it's over already. So anyway, Lou, thank you, or Paul, thank you. Lou, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hofkin, thank you. Nihad El Sharif, straight from Egypt, thank you. Felix Sandoval from Columbia, South America, thank you. Phil Heidia. Paul Flager, all you guys and gals, and Steve Froming, I really appreciate you dialing in, watching, asking questions. I look forward to exploring lighting again next week in part two. Homework is going to be nice. Yep, Felix, I will get you these questions. I'll post these sometime today. So look on our social media tomorrow uh, and my social media tomorrow. So we will. I'll get these uh, questions out so that y'all can uh, take a look at it. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for what each of you do for electrical safety and for the electrical industry. And remember to always be safe and please stay healthy. See you next week.